So now we're going to move on to the scattering states. So the setup that we have is the finite square well from negative a to positive a. And so previously we were focusing on the bound states. And those correspond to the case where the energy level is below zero. So once your energy level reaches above zero, then what you're going to get are the scattering states. And, and you're going to get the scattering states because when x tends towards positive and negative infinity, you can see that the energy level is larger than the potential because uh, outside of the well, the potential is just zero. So you can see that the energy level is larger than the potential when you tend towards positive and negative infinity. And so that's why you're going to get a, a, a scattering state. So once again, like before, we're going to divide this setup here into three regions. Region one, which is smaller than negative a, region 2 which is between negative and positive a and then region 3 which is above positive a and then we're going to solve the Schrodinger equation for these three separate regions and then we're going to combine our answers so let's focus on region 1 which is x is smaller than negative a so once again we just write out the time independent Schrodinger equation and then within this region the potential is 0 so I just I can just omit that and you have e times xi so dumping everything over to the other side you get something like this and this is the second derivative of xi of x and then I'm just going to combine everything into one constant k so you can see that k is equal to the square root of 2 me divided by h bar so you can compare this with what we got for the pre uh, for the bound state cases so when we were solving the Schrodinger equation for the bound state our k was actually the square root of negative 2 me that, because that would uh, because for that case, the e was negative. So that's why we have a negative sign inside the square root to make this whole term positive. And then for the differential equation, you would still get k squared, but without the negative sign. But now this time around, things are a bit different. Our e is positive, and that's why you get something like this. You have a k squared with a negative sign on the outside. And for such a differential equation, this is pretty much what you get for a simple harmonic oscillator. And the general solution is a times e to the power of i k x plus b to the power of negative i k x. So this is the xi of x for the region x is smaller than negative a. Now for region 2 which is between negative a and positive a. So once again we have the time independent Schrodinger equation and then we have the potential, which in this case is equal to negative v naught, so we just put down negative v naught times xi, which is equal to e times xi. And so you see that the second derivative is equal to negative 2m e plus v naught divided by h bar square times xi. And then we're going to call this term over here l square. And so that implies that l is defined by this formula. And divided by h bar, and then once again you get this uh, you get this answer here that looks pretty much like the uh, harmonic os uh, the differential equation that you would get for the harmonic oscillator. So for xi of x, so we could express it in such a form uh, in terms of e, uh, e to the power of i uh, i x and e to the power of negative i x, but for the region between negative a and positive a, it's uh, more convenient for us to use uh, sines and cosines. So instead, I'm just going to write everything out like this. Cosine Alex. So this is more consistent with, with what we've been doing before. So remember last time when we were dealing with the bounce table, this is what we did for the region between negative and positive A as well. So uh, just don't forget that this expression can also be uh, rearranged into such a form. So they're basically the same. It's just a different way of expressing the same thing. And then moving on to region 3, which is the case where x is larger than a. And then you will essentially get something that is very similar to this. So you get pretty much get the exact same thing as in region 1. So in region 3, for the case where x is larger than a, the potential is just equal to 0. So you just get e times xi. So you just rearrange everything in the same way. So in the end, you get d squared xi dx squared is equal to negative k square xi, where k is defined in such a way. And then xi of x is going to be equal to some constant times e to the power of i k x plus another constant e to the power of negative i k x. So now let's summarize everything and combine everything into one expression.
So this is what we have so far. So for the region, uh, x is smaller than negative a, we have a times e to the power of i k x plus b times e to the power of negative i k x. For the region between negative and positive a, we have c times sine lx plus d cosine lx. And then for the, for the region x is larger than a, so we have these two terms over here, but we're going to do something uh, that we do some, we're going to do something similar to what we did in the case when we were at, as in the example in the book when we were dealing with the direct delta potential at the origin and that we're going to take away this term over here just we're just going to get rid of this term we're just going to keep the f times e to the power of i k x so if i take away the g now this whole setup here this xi of x is going to be a case where you're going to have a wave that's going to travel towards the right and the sum of it is going to bounce back and some of it is going to pass through the well and then keep on going forward and so by taking away the g this is what we've turned our whole system into where uh, the solution pretty much assimilates this case where you have a wave coming forward over to the right and some of it bounces backwards and some of it uh, continues through the well so uh, you can see that this is pretty similar to what we did for the direct delta potential so we're doing pretty much the same thing and uh, so the next thing we should do now is to connect uh, these three solutions together. So the way we connect these three solutions is that we need to require that xi of x and also d xi dx to be continuous. And so that's why for the region at x is equal to a, we require this function to be xi of x to be continuous, and that is why f times e to the power of i k a should be equal to substituting a uh, for this result here. So you get c times sine la plus d cosine la. And then continuity should also be enforced for x is equal to negative a. So that's why this expression when you substitute in negative a should be equal to this expression when you substitute in negative a. And so that gives you uh, a times e to the power of negative i k a. So you can see that all I did was substitute negative a here for x and then substituting in negative a, you get e to the power of i k a, and then you do the same for this term. So you get c times sine negative l a, so which is equal to negative c sine l a. And then we have d cosine negative l a, but cosine negative l a is just equal to cosine l a. So I can just express it, everything like this. So here are two expressions that you can obtain from the continuity requirement for psi of x. But then we also know that dz dx should also be continuous. And so that is why we need to compare the dz dx as well. So let's try to differentiate our xi of x. So differentiating dz dx, so once again, we split everything up into three regions. So for this region, you get uh, i k times f times e to the power of i k x. This is for the region x is larger than a. And then for the region between negative and positive a, you get c times l cosine lx because you're differentiating sine lx and the differentiating cosine you get negative sine so you get negative dl sine lx and then for the bottom region you just differentiate these two terms so you get i k a e to the power of i k x and then minus i k b e to the power of negative i k x and this is for the region x is smaller than negative a so now we have found dz dx, so now we need to consider the continuity requirement for dz dx. And so once again, pretty similar to last time, we focus on x is equal to a, and then at x, e x is equal to a, dz dx should be, should be uh, continuous, so that's why this expression should be equal to this expression. So that's why you get uh, i k f e to the power of i k a should be equal to u substituting in a for this expression which is equal to L, so I'm just going to pull the L over out to the outside, times C cosine LA minus D sine LA. And then you do the same thing for X is equal to negative A. So once again, you substitute in, uh, you substitute in negative A as for these two expressions, and then they should be equal. So if you substitute in negative A for this, you're going to get, and you're just going to pull the IK out to the outside, and you're going to get A times E to the power of negative i k a minus b times e to the power of positive i k a. 
is equal to substituting in negative uh, a for this expression. So you get L C cosine L A. So notice that the negative sign does not uh, affect the cosine term. And then here you have negative sine uh, negative A L. So you get two and you get a negative sign inside this sign. And then you also have a negative sign on the outside. So both of those cancel out. So you get plus D sine L A. And so this is the second expression that you get from the continuity requirement of these IDX. So combining the these expressions that you got, so this expression, this expression, and these two over here, with a lot of tedious calculations, you can obtain your transmission coefficients and your reflection coefficients and everything uh, that you would expect to get uh, from your analysis over here. So I'm not gonna uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave those steps for a later problem. So one of the problems in this section is going to be uh, about the details of arriving at those uh, coefficients. So I'm just going to leave it for that. I'm not going to calculate it in this video. So, uh, so you can see the results in the book. I'm not going to copy them out. So, so pretty much that is all I'm going to show you for this video. So this is how you start off with your scattering state. And then you just, you pretty much do the same thing as before. You solve the Schrodinger equation for the three regions. And then you consider the continuity requirements to obtain these uh, relationships, which would help you obtain your transmission and reflection coefficients. And then one thing you should notice is that for the, uh, for the case where the transmission coefficient is equal to 1, if you take a look at the transmission coefficient, the expression for the transmission coefficient that Griffiths has already derived for you, you will see that the transmission coefficient will only be equal to 1 if this property is satisfied. You will see that this expression is inside a sign term. And if this expression is equal to n pi, that sign term will be evaluated down to 0 which would give you a transmission coefficient equal to 1, which means uh, the, the wave that you have, right, when it reaches the well, it's going to completely pass through it, so none of it is going to be reflected back. And you can see that for that case to happen, this condition must be satisfied. And with a bit of rearranging, you can see that this, uh, this requirement actually implies that e plus v0 is equal to n squared pi squared h bar square divided by 2m and then 2a square. Now you can see that this is exactly the expression you would get for an infinite square well with a width of 2a. So this is a pretty remarkable result. So you're dealing with a finite square well but in certain cases uh, for the case where the transmission coefficient is equal to 1 somehow you would obtain an energy level that is equal that is given by the formula for the energy levels of the infinite square well which is a different setup. So this is quite a remarkable result.